And you can see the sun is almost setting directly west. It's still a little southwest during the winter months because we're travel. actually as we of course um, rotate, it looks as if the sun is passing in front of us, but it's the shortest arc. And when we get into the summer, it will be a wider arc. It'll be more like west, northwest and northeast. Um, so right now I'm going to go ahead and move it a little forward. And I have the planetarium latitude and longitude set for here in Cartersville. And this is about what the night sky would look like if it's clear tonight or if we could see through the clouds. And does anybody see something they know already? And I'm thinking of a couple things right over here. Here's one of them. The moon, right, it's just a, just a sliver of the moon right there. And then above the moon, anybody know what this is? It is Mars, yes, and it's actually, we're very far away from Mars. Mars is moving farther away in its orbit, and so is the moon. And just for fun, let me see if I can, um, if I could put up their arc, their elliptic, their path. So let's go ahead and go to Mars. And okay, let's see if I can do this. Let's bring Mars up. Of course, the moon is in front of it, but there is the red planet. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Let me put it back in. And here, light years apart, but they do travel in a group, and they're so far away from Earth, even though they're part of our solar system, that they look as if they belong together. The first one I see is one of the easiest ones to spot in the winter sky, and that's this guy right here. Anybody recognize it? These three um, stars that make up its belt are its characteristic landmark. Orion. This is Orion the Hunter. And so most of our constellations are named from the ancient Greek and Roman cultures, civilizations, and they come from their stories of history, but also of their, their, uh, their relig ancient religions. So we have Orion the Hunter here, and you can spot it because of, I told you those three in the middle that make his belt. These are two that mark his arms. Down here we have his legs, kind of a rectangular shape. And underneath the belt, we have this very fuzzy area, kind of his scabbard there. So let me go ahead and, and do a dot to dot for you. Would you, would you like that? Yeah. So we can yeah. see what he looks like? So everybody, use your imagination and let's connect those stars. There he is, there's our warrior. There's Orion. And what, wait a minute, no self-respecting hunter goes out without his faithful companion hunting dog. And so let's take a look at that. And we go right over here, and we have Sirius, the dog star. It's part of the constellation Sirius. It's one of the closest stars to Earth, and so it's one of the brightest objects in the night sky. I think it's the, the ninth brightest object. So let's go ahead and put together Canis Major, which means big dog in Latin. Here goes our imagination. Does that look like a dog? Yeah. Okay, well, above Sirius, his nose, there's another bright star, and it's called Procyon. And it actually means before the dog, and that's right here. And it's part of a constellation called Canis Minor, which means the little dog, or the lesser dog. So let's see him. Here comes Canis Major. Does that look like a dog? No. Maybe a hot dog? That's the only dog I think that one looks like. So we will do a little, have a little more fun with him later. But let's go see what Orion is hunting. So if you go to his belt, these three stars. So I want to point this belt out. It's called an asterism. A smaller grouping that's part of a constellation is called asterism. And if you go toward the east, you'll get to Sirius. And if you go up here to the north and west, you're gonna to get to a very bright object and sometimes it's very orange in the night sky because this is an orange um, supergiant star. It's called Eldebaran and it's the eye of a bull. So here's his face. Kind of, there's kind of a V shape of stars here. Then there's a patch on his back, kind of a hazy patch called the Pleiades or Seven Sisters and I'll tell you about them a little bit later. His horns up here and his legs down here. Let's connect him and see what he might look like. Okay, Taurus. Here he goes. There he is. 
mob will they be so that's Taurus the bull and these are just wonderful constellations so let me point out a couple in fact before I do any more I want to go ahead and change the night sky so I have it looking the way we would see it we can usually make out about 100 to 200 stars with unaided eye here in a suburban area because of all the lights that we humans like to have on at night. Our street lights, airplanes, cars, our house lights, um, security systems, stores, even our houses are all lit up. So it's hard to make out the night sky. So I'm gonna magically transform it to the way it would look if you were in a dark sky area or way up in the mountains. So we can see a few more stars. And of course, we see that arc of the Milky Way galaxy mm -hmm. going up between the dogs and by Orion and Taurus. That's, of course, part of our Milky Way galaxy, a galaxy made up of billions of stars, just like our sun, some bigger, some smaller, some the about the same planets, size, right? some about the same age. Um, and there are many, many myths planets. about the Milky Way from different cultures to history and around the world. Um, the, uh, ancient Greeks and Romans saw it as a river of milk, and so they called it the Milky Way. Uh, the ancient Chinese used to think of it as a river of silver fish, and they explained its disappearance um, on a, a very bright full moon night, or when you can't see it, as the, that these silver fish were very shy, and so they would dive down and hide under water um, when the moon was out. But my very favorite story right now comes from Eastern Europe, a group of people that went through a time of tremendous hardship. No rain fell, their crops didn't grow, and they were very hungry, hungry and starving people. And their, their benevolent king, their good king, was so concerned about this um, lack of food that he traveled around the known world gathering grain and other food to bring back to his people. And apparently, according to the story, he decided to take a shortcut and travel across the sky to get back home. And as he went, of course, he dropped some grains of, of rice and wheat. And so that's what we see in the night sky. So the importance of that story was to tell a people about an important time in their history and about a very good king, so that when they looked up at the night sky, they would remind themselves of those times. So that's the story about the Milky Way. And you might even make up your own. So before I show you a little more about the constellations, there is another one hiding underneath Orion's legs. You are not gonna believe this one. Right in here. He's hard to make out. He's got two ears over here. He's got some feet, then a body. And it would be something that a hunter might look for. This one is called Lepus the Hare. So he's hiding. And nobody's paying any attention to him because he's focused on Taurus and Sirius is following Orion the Hunter. So let's go ahead and use our imaginations and fill them in a little bit more. So let's take a look at our little hair. He might look like this. Mm -hmm. And Canis Minor, it does bother me to see those just two stars up there. So let's see what he could look like. And Canis Major would look like this perhaps. And Taurus, the bull, surely looks more fearsome than we see up there. He could look like this. Yeah. And do you think we should do something to Orion as well? Yes. Yep. OK, here we go. So now, if you lived long ago before there was any electricity, and maybe you were in charge of taking care of your family's sheep or goats, and you lived out near a very arid area, and you're up staring at the night sky, you might tell stories about it, and you might actually see them moving. Okay, just a little fun that we can do here in the planetarium. So let's go ahead and let's take a, let me get Orion off, but I'm gonna keep the lines up, and I'm going to take Canis Major and Canis Minor off, and I'm going to put Taurus back to his constellation shape, because I want to talk about a few deep sky objects. Um, so if we look at Taurus, oops, I left Lepus up there. Okay, Lepus, there you go. Um, if you go, let's go back and look up at Taurus, and look at that star Aldebaran right up, right up here. So as I said, it's a red supergiant. It's about 44 times the diameter of our own sun. 
Isn't that amazing? And we think it's near the end of its life. It's about seven light years away from Earth. Um, so the, the light that we're seeing emitted, that we see up in the sky right now was emitted seven, seven years ago. And right back here on the black, the, the back of Taurus, this is a cluster of stars called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters, and they are actually 150 million, 150 light years away, so they're much farther away, but it looks as if they're part of that constellation. So let's kind of take a look at the Pleiades here. Um, if we, let me mark it so you can see it, and they're, they're visible with your unaided eye, but they certainly are even prettier with a pair of binoculars. So that's the Pleiades, and here's what it might look like through a telescope. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. It's a star nursery where stars are, are being born. There's a Native American legend that talks about the seven <coughs> sisters, the seven brightest stars, that goes something like this. So children were playing outside and they got lost and they went farther and farther away from their, their home. So they didn't hear anyone calling them. And so finally, after days of searching, they found the children and they brought them back. So the, according to the legend that Native American parents of a, what, I'm not sure which tribe, um, would tell the story to their kids to remind them to stay home and not get lost. But I want to show you one more thing. Right up in the horns, near the end of the horns of Taurus, and this is hard to see without um, a good, good telescope. There's something called the Crab Nebula. So let me put that up there. It's located right here, and it looks like this. Whoa. So this was created by a supernova, a bursting star, and the different colors represent the different kinds of elements that are there in that star cluster. There's lots of gas and dust and these elements. It had been spotted and recorded as long ago as in 1054 by the ancient Chinese. And there's even some evidence of it in cave art. So this has been a, a celestial observation for centuries. Let's put that back. There we go. And I want to just turn your attention to Orion. Um, under his belt, you see a, one bright star, and there's a kind of a, a hazy patch between right here. And this is actually another star nursery. It's the Orion Nebula. And it, you can spot the hazy area with your unaided eyes and see it a little better with binoculars, but you need a good telescope to really really see them. So let me show you what the nebula might look like through a telescope. That's a place where many, many millions of stars are, are being formed. Isn't that beautiful? So it's a big gas cloud and um, it's just huge. So I want to show you one other one while we're here and I want to see if you could figure out what the name is. And it has to do with something you see in it, a shape. Here's where it's located. That looks like a horse. Did you say a horse? Yes, that looks like a horse. It's called the Horsehead Nebula. Yep, that is. That's exactly what it's called. Good job. Um, it does look like a horse. It's kind of a, it's called a reflecting or a reflection nebula. So it's reflecting a lot of interstellar gas and dust. It's a lot of hydrogen in it. Those different layers of colors are different layers of gases that make up that, that nebula. So thank you for that help. I'll put that back in the sky. Now, let me go ahead and take off Orion's line. Good job. It's marking. Can you still find Orion? No. Good. So if you can find Orion, just use his belt and go up toward the west and north and you'll find Aldebaran and Taurus. And let me just show you again. So here it is, here's Aldebaran, and then you see this hazy patch here, the Seven Sisters right there. And again, you go s southeast from the belt and you're gonna find that bright, bright star, Sirius. Oh, okay. You can imagine that dog up there in the sky and go up and see Procyon right here. So we have a little bit of time left and I thought maybe it would be fun since we're talking so much about Mars today to take you to Mars. Would you like to go to Mars? Yes. Okay, buckle up, here we go. <laughs> I'm not the best flyer, so I hope we make this mission okay. Oh, we are staying in our solar oh system, goodness. so you will notice constellations like the Dipper up there. We will see Orion again.
because they're all apparent in our in our um, galaxy. Whoa, whoa. Okay, there's our planet. We are now in outer space. So, what is this <coughs> light over here? The sun. No, yeah, that's Earth. And what's the light here? The sun. That's the, the reflection of the sun. So, what time of day is it over here? Daytime. Daytime. What time is it over here? Nighttime. Nighttime. Nighttime in our country. And look at all the lights we humans have. It makes it really hard to see the night sky, but we have a special place here in Georgia, right down here, right near Florida, right there, if I can keep my hand steady. It's Stephen Foster State Park. Has anyone been there? No. I haven't either, but it is considered one of the international dark sky locations on Earth. And I've heard that the stargazing there and planet watching is magnificent. So anyway, just wanted to point that out. So that's why sometimes it's hard for us to really uh, make out the stars at night. So let's go ahead and travel out a little further. So Mars, of course, is the fourth planet from the sun, and it's, it's only about 34, 35 million miles from us. There it is. It's known as the red planet because of the iron in its soil and the iron oxidizes with the oxygen and it gives it that red appearance, much like our Georgia clay. So um, let's see if I can do some little tricks here. I want to get it a little closer to us so that we can, I cannot show <laughs> you the Jezero crater where the rover is going to be landing today, but I can show you something like it. So you can see all these markings. Um, Mars, which is actually smaller, of course, than Earth, has had a lot of impact, has a lot of impact craters, which means that meteorites perhaps hitting it in its formation, and it also has volcanic activity. In fact, the largest volcano in our solar system is on Mars, Olympic Mons. But so I'm going to show you about kind of the area that they picked to set the rover down. It's something like this. It's like a delta that's formed at the end of what seems to be maybe a dried riverbed, maybe, perhaps, and I'm saying maybe, perhaps, because they don't really know. Um, but it does have an alluvial fan pattern, much like our deltas, where water slows down its speed or velocity, and it deposits the sediment it's been carrying. Think um, Louisiana, New Orleans and those places where the Mississippi deposits all that new land. So it's there that they're going to be trying to, to set down the perseverance that um, the new rover. And right now it's already just about ready to do its EDL, its entry, descent, and landing. That's a very important part of the trip. It's gonna happen this afternoon. And when it gets quite close to the surfaces, surface of Mars, they're using a technology called terrain relative navigation. And that's where cameras on the bottom of Perseverance are actually taking real-time pictures of the landscape and they're comparing it to maps that are loaded into its computer system to see if they're landing in the right place. Isn't that amazing? Um, some of the tests that it's going to be running on there it are tests to see what they can do to convert some of the conditions there on Mars to make it suitable for astronauts to spend some time there. So they'll actually be trying to convert CO2 that's in the atmosphere of Mars into oxygen so that they would make it possible for astronauts to, to breathe um, and not just carry all the oxygen they need. They're also looking at the caps. Let me see if I can show us the polar caps. Let's see. You can see there's a bit of frozen water on the surface of Mars. Over here on the caps, the same with the other cap. And over here on this highland area. And they're doing tests, not on this particular mission, but they're going to be doing some other tests to see if they can take that water and um, use it as fuel to either maneuver vehicles on the surface of Mars so they don't have to carry all the fuel up there or to convert it into fuel so that they can um, bring uh, the astronauts back home and use that as some of their supplementary fuel. So they're doing all sorts of tests. They're actually looking to see if there's any sign of life as we know it um, on, in the rocks. They're doing what's called astrogeology and astrobiology, and they're looking at the rocks 
and seeing what they can tell us about whether or not there was water there. And our staff met with a scientist um, over Zoom yesterday who told us that there's an inherent bias in their, some of their investigations because they're looking for things we already know about. And they said the one problem with that is they might miss features or characteristics or indicators of unique life forms that we don't even know about. But that's kind of a risk that you take. They're collecting lots of rocks. And so as our technology and knowledge develops when they get those rocks back here on Earth, they'll be able to run tests later and later in history. They're still doing new tests on our moon rocks that were gathered um, over 50 years ago because we have new technology and new information to know. Um, bring it a little bit closer now. I'll make it go back out. Oh, I see one of its moons over there. Do you see it moving? Mm -hmm. Let's just take a really quick look at it. The moon. They have two, Mars has two moons. Let's watch. The largest oh. one is Phobos, from where we get the word oh. phobia. <laughs> um, and the other one is Diamos, which I believe is anxiety, or fear, no fear. Problem. And so they are funniest moons. They're, they're not as round and spherical as ours, and they're, you can see their shape. I think they look like um, potatoes. <laughs> so this is Phobos, the largest one. It's, about, it's only 13 miles long, and here comes Deimos. It's only nine miles. Oh. Now, it's not as potato-ish looking, but it's certainly not a, a nice, perfect sphere. Um, the theory is that perhaps they were stray asteroids that somehow made it into Mars. Um, it got captured by Mars gravity, and so now, and I'm sure over many, many years, they will turn more and more spherical. So I think it's time that we head back to Earth, so let's see if I can get us back there. And I hope I land here in Cartersville, so you don't have to find another way to get home. Here we go. I see our spring constellations in front of us, Sagittarius, Scorpius. Okay, this is the proof. Hey, look, look who's in front of us. Orion, right, and I can see Sirius, the dog, Canis Major and Canis Minor, I see Taurus, we landed just where we needed to be. So let me go ahead and move time forward. So as we move forward, of course, this is really the Earth rotating. Now we're rotating closer toward the sun. We're actually now, st I'm starting to see some of our spring constellations, Leo the lion and Virgo and Bautes the hunter. And the first action is it's only five in the morning. Here comes our sun and a new day. And as the sun appears, I'm going to just share a poem from my faith tradition um, that I think is so beautiful. It goes, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the sun and the, mo the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what are humans that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? I hope you will take time in the next few weeks to go outside and look up at the sky um, and just enjoy the wonderment of our celestial view that we have here from here on Earth. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day and I hope you'll be able to watch the landing of Perseverance. <laughs>